break. So uh, I I have some uh, some questions that I that uh, we could talk about, but I'm also uh, I'd love for you guys to chat, and uh, we also uh, there was some some stuff left at the end of last time, so um, we have preferences of okay. which. Well, I'd suggest that you t tell us the things that would interest you, and I'll tell you a couple of areas that I'd like to go into at some point, and and then um, Richard, if you have some that you do. Um, I mean, there are two rather massive areas of interest um, for me. I mean, one clearly is this business of lateralization in, in life and how much you, you, for example, share my belief that this is important functionally and changes effectively the experience of the creature, the organism. And, and the, the other is um, the difference between living organisms and machines, particularly in the sense of there being uh, complex systems that are intrinsically uh, unpredictable. And that whereas with a machine, you can start from the ground up with the syntax of the machine and work out its meaning at some higher higher level of what it's doing. You can't really do this with an organism. You have to sort of work from both ends, if you like, if you like top down and seeing what it is achieving and where what it is seeming to drive at and from the bottom. But you can't actually get to the full meaning of the organism by working in a mechanical way from um, the bottom up. So th those would be two areas that if they're of interest to you, whether you agree or not, I don't know, but uh, I'd be happy to talk about those. Great. Yeah, that sounds that sounds excellent. Um, Richard, any specific topics for you? Uh, many. <laughs> I really enjoyed <laughs> reading your chapters, Ian. Uh, uh, the lots, lots of that material really resonated with me very strongly. Um, hmm. but, uh, for a while, I found my, my linear mind getting frustrated that you wouldn't tell me in the right order what things that I needed to know, of course. Uh, <laughs> and then I realized that, of course, you were giving the example of spiraling around the topic, which was just what you were. Exactly. Uh, so then I felt a little bit more at ease, and that was okay. <laughs> uh, but um, I would like to talk about top-down and bottom-up understanding. So that resonates with what you just said about top-down and bottom-up understanding mm. of living things. I would like to dig in a little bit on the metaphor of music. And as you say, metaphor is the stuff of thought. So, you know, I really mm. think that there's something, there's something there that, that crosses new gaps uh, that would be worth discussing. Mm. Um, and relatedly, there's stuff about um, folding away detail to get at the general shape of things. That, um, that when you look at the detail of things, you can't see the general shape. You can't see the infinity for all of the steps involved. Um, so those are the sorts of things which are on my mind. But the the leap between machines and living things is, you know, captures a lot of that. Mm. Mm. Would you what like would to you say, Mike? Mm. Yeah, no, perfect. Uh, let's let's do all of that. Uh, um, some of my stuff will come up while we're doing this, and other things so that you know I can keep till next time. It's fine. These, these are these are great. So yeah, I mean may, maybe maybe uh, we can start with 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 some of the lateralization uh, stuff, uh, and and specifically, um, I guess I guess one one thing one one place we can start is is for you, uh, Ian, but to maybe talk about. To, to what extent do you think it, the architecture is specifically bilaterally symmetric? In other words, that you need to have exactly two things that are tied in a particular way, or and or is the is is more of the magic in the specific uh, breakdown of the roles and how you know how they how what 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 the different functions of each one is? Because I'm I'm very interested in something. I worked for left in left right asymmetry for a long time, but uh, I, I, I'm interested in alternative architectures, right? So, so could we have, uh, are there cognitive systems, either synthetic that we can make or alien, you know, or whatever that could be in a completely different architecture? You know, we, we are in a position to make 
uh, animals with as many hemispheres as you want, really, right? So we can make three, four. You, know? you can you can make you can make these things, and so and so the question is, so I'm interested in how you know what is the essential, what what do you think is the essential bit here, and uh, you know, w w with Richard, we had also talked about at one point we talked about um, a couple of things. He and he, you know he, he can talk about this uh, the, the the importance of the sort of ebb and flow of these kinds of systems, and also Richard at one point a few uh, this was weeks ago you had a really interesting comment about uh, the the computational power of having a second copy so that you could right. So what happens when you have sort of room to offload some things in the meantime? So um, anyway, so so yeah, please you know go go for it. I think I think that's a good that's a good topic. Hmm. <laughs> well, you may or may not know that uh, but it's a theme that becomes more prominent in the matter with things and particularly towards the second part, um, or, or I should say the second volume, um, that we need things in the, the opposites or countries and we need them both to maintain their integrity as distinct from one another, and yet also to be capable of a sort of union. So we need the, the principles of division and union together, so that when I think about the two hemispheres, there's evidence that they they sometimes work together in a in a sense that we would normally call collaborating they, they they're working together in the same way towards certain ends but they're often complementing one another by taking different approaches and that this is important and that we, we mustn't sort of either collapse them into being versions of the same thing or say that they are um so distinct that they don't um work, work cooperatively which they clearly do I mean that's that also sounds like uh, some of the stuff that uh, you know Richard has been talking about as far as alternating cycles of being s soft in terms of letting letting the world imprint on you for a while and then coming back to push right. Yes. Yeah, that's why I, I brought that up because I thought that that might be, be re related to what Richard was saying. Yeah, I think that um, the union and division, right? It's the if um if the brain were not in halves uh then you you wouldn't be able to have any um uh, differences between the two parts right it's important that you have differences because the differences between them create create a whole that's worth having right if the if the two parts exactly. were the same as each other then you would just you just have double what you had before. Mm. It's important that they're different because by being different, they create a whole that's more than the sum of the parts through the relation between them. Yeah, I I take your question, Mike. That uh, did it have to be two? What if you divided it into three parts? And I am bothered by that. <laughs> because <laughs> because um it feels like maybe you could do things dividing into threes and not twos um dividing into twos is the is the obvious way to do things it's like if you if you can't do something with one then make a copy of it differentiate them and now you can do something more than you could do with the one of them but there's there's something about the I don't know, this, this is either going to sound mad or it's going to resonate with you. Um, there's something about the period doubling in the logistic map mm. that eventually exits chaos in a third that um, that makes me think that they're, you know, that well, basically the thirds are real <laughs> and it doesn't have to always be period doubling. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I mean, it, it's it's natural to think of of twos and so on. But actually, if you think about early embryonic development, where where that that uh, n never mind the asymmetry of the just just the the drawing a midline that 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 is 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 really not well understood at all. 
Um, there's a lot mm -hmm. of sort of what happens after you've got sort of a left and right to half. But that first, especially in amniotes, how it is that you divide, you, know, you got the, you know, the thousands and tens of thousands of cells. And then how you decide where that midline is, 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 is completely non-trivial. And uh, we can, we can inter interfere in that process and make, make other types of, and of course there are animals with, with other types of symmetries, but bi bilateral symmetry shows up very early on. Uh, chirality is there even before that. Uh, hmm. But it's it's not super obvious how you bisect something that that has lots and lots of uh, little, you know little tiny. Uh, so um, organisms with symmetries that are odd, uh, like starfish. Is there is there a nice three way symmetry? Um. So 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 if I recall correctly, the starfish are actually not fivefold really they're sort of bilateral with a with a you know like a like a like a vitruvian man type of thing and but but there are but there are um jellyfish the jellyfish do have true multiple you know and and symmetries and there's and there are all kinds uh hmm. and then they're, they're not always factors of they're not always powers of two they can be no, yeah no no yeah that's that's interesting that a lot of them, my creatures that i showed you the video the other day michael a lot of them look like jellyfish right yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. yeah. Although, yeah. Well, a, a couple of reflections I just make. Uh, one is that this lateral asymmetry is present in the earliest neural network of which we have any knowledge, 700 million years ago. It has this axial asymmetry. Um, and there's a very good reason, I believe, why that should be the case because of this business of the organism needing to pay finely uh, focused, narrowly focused, targeted attention to a detail that it already requires and its ability simultaneously to keep the precisely opposite kind of attention open, the, the broad vigilant attention without preconception as to what it might find or what it's interested in. So that makes a natural, as it were, pairing. And out of that pairing, almost anything can come. After all, through the pairings of one and zero, many, many complex structures can be made. Uh, as soon as you've got two, you've already got potentially many things. Because as I often say, you need both, um, you need both, both and, and either or. So you need the situation where it's either or, that, that is an important distinction in life, but it's also important to have that as well as the both and ability to synthesize these things. As soon as you've got that, you've already got more than two things. You've got, you've got either and or, <laughs> and you've got the, the combination of the two and the relationship between all three of them. And so the thing uh, expands from there. So although it may begin for very good evolutionary reasons as a, a, um, you know, a, a, a pair, um, more than that, almost infinitely more of that can emerge from it. Mm -hmm. So one could explain brain uh, bilateral symmetry by the fact that it's growing in an organism that already has bilateral symmetry, if we're not. But uh, if we take the organism itself to be fundamentally cognitive, even before it had a brain in a basal cognition sort of way, then, you know, that's just saying, you know, bilateralism was always about cognition and bilateral hemispheres in brains was just a particular extension of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you go right back to the origin of multicellularity, it's like, well, was that likely to have occurred through cell divisions which didn't separate, in which case two would have been a natural number? Um, but uh, and you know then the 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 vibration that you can get between two cells that's different from the vibration that you can get in either one cell that you because you mm. can coordinate it right now you can have them you can have one doing. Uh, they could just be, you know, I'll be on when you're off, right? We're the same, we're the same period, but out of phase. I don't think there's any point in them being the same period and in phase. If they're the same period and out of phase, then that's, you know, I'll be on when you're off, you'll be off when I'm on. Uh, but there's also the possibility that one is doing something at twice the frequency of the other, which is stable. Mm -hmm. 
but uh, now they're doing something intrinsically different. Mm. Um, and it seems like, um, you know, it would be, it would be natural to create things which were powers of two that way, um, that will do two doublings instead of one doubling. But mm -hmm. it's also, you know, when you do, you know, the fact that the fact that the Taylor expansion gives you a third by, you know, one minus a half plus a quarter minus an eighth minus a sixteenth gives you a third and that the pattern that you have to do to do that is a, just an oscillating pattern to do that mm -hmm. um there's i think there's actually something really i think it's i think it is very natural mike that it's pairs to start with i think that that's a very there's there's good reasons for that but I also think that there's something very interesting in considering other factors. Yeah. Other multiple. But a couple of other things occur to me on that. Um, one is you mentioned that chirality goes um, well before uh, life, and it does. And of course, uh, famously, there is um, the, the weak force is, is chiral in, in its nature. Um, and chirality has a left-handed spiral and a, a right-handed spiral. I'm not sure what the spiral would be that was the third candid spiral, as you would mean. That, that's, that's where all this, in a way, starts. And the other thing is that in the, the metaphysics part of the matter with things, I spend a lot of time on the importance of the coincidence of opposites. And much of everything that we see seems to be structured on what we call opposites because we think in this sense of them being at opposite ends of something but they may just be the complements of one another that you cannot have one without the other this is a very very ancient insight it it, it, it it's present probably in all the sophisticated cultures that we know of um and so yeah i mean i think it's <laughs> it, and it was, you know, in, in, in the 19th century, it was Pasteur who said life needs asymmetry. Um, symmetry it may have in places, but that's completely unimportant. It's asymmetry that allows life to flourish. And it does so, he thought, because it reflected the innate asymmetry of the cosmos. And Pierre Curie, commenting 20, 30 years later, said that the the asymmetry of the cosmos, not so much of life, but of the cosmos, was absolutely central to its existence and persistence. So I think this idea of asymmetry is is good. And asymmetry and symmetry are a pairing that mop up um, what else, I mean, what would be your third thing in there? I mean, the third thing is chaos, actually. It's simply chaos. It, it, you know, not everything that is not symmetrical is, strictly speaking, asymmetrical. It may just be a mess. <laughs> You know, uh, one, 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 one interesting thing about uh, uh, in, in the establishment of, of, of symmetry in the early embryo, it's, it's very easy. There, there are many treatments that we've discovered that confuse the left and the right halves about which one they are. So you can get double left, yeah. double right. Uh, you can get mirror image. That, that's, that's very easy. But uh, of all of those treatments, in, in every single case, except for one, which we finally at the end discovered, but but it took a long time. Everything else, all it does is it confuses which side thinks it's left and which side it's right, but all of the individual cells within that side agree. So if you use a marker that determine, that shows you whether something's left and right, you never see speckled, you never see every cell confused and its neighbor has a different option. You don't see that. You just see you know this way, this way, this way, or this way. Uh, but there is exactly one thing that we found that breaks the concordance, right? So normally you can you can randomize it and you can make the the left and right halves flip a coin as to which they are. But all of the cells yes. within each half flip the same coin, with one exception. There's only one thing that breaks that, and the thing that breaks it is a cellular alignment mechanism, L literally alignment, with, but but also metaphorically, I think you know alignment in the cognitive sense. But but it's a it's a planar polarity mechanism that allows the cells to 
be literally aligned in the same direction, not even in left, right. It's actually an alignment in, in anterior posterior. But but once you break that, then you get the speckling. And then you get individual cells that don't know what to do, as opposed to whole co coherent, cohesive regions that don't know what to do. So, you know, I, I, I really like that whole that whole model as this like way of thinking about what does it take to make selves, to make a, a coherent individual out of pieces that makes a, a collective decision, right? This sort of collective decision making. Um, and, and what did, significance would you attribute to this final case that you described uh, with the anterior posterior alignment, uh, but not left right um, uh, coherence? I think if that I've understood you right. Yeah, yeah. I, th I, I think, I think the the reason the reason that that I found it interesting is because what it gets to is this question of collective decision making so so what is a collective intelligence right and so which which we, we all are in a sense and so what we the, the question we have to answer is in what sense does the collective have goals memories whatever else that the individual pieces don't have how do these right so so we are a bunch of cells fine but but then we have uh, uh um all, all kinds of uh, you know sort of uh, cognitive and morphological properties that the individual parts don't have and so that right at the beginning of embryogenesis, when 50,000 cells have to come together to give one, one, what one embryo, one individual, eventually one, you know, let's say in the case of humans, one human, this is, this is a breakdown of that collective decision-making process. And we, we have many other examples of where, where they all, all of the components begin to make decisions as one they're all synchronized. And some of that is bioelectrical. Some of it is, is, is these planar polarity alignment mechanisms. But uh, to me, this is the root of the whole business. When you start with 50,000 cells and you look at it and you say, ah, this is one embryo, right? Like, what are you counting when you say it's one embryo? You're, what, what you're in a functional sense, and it doesn't have to be one because I, I can't recall if we have already talked about this, but if you make little scratches in it, for, for the, what you'll get is multiple conjoined twins because until that scratch heals, each portion doesn't know that there's other portions around and it and it basically decides I'm going to be the embryo. And then of course they all do that and then eventually they heal. So you can have twins and triplets and whatnot. And so this issue of how many individuals, how many humans are in any one uh, uh, embryo is not fixed by the genetics. It's not fixed by the physics. It's a uh, it's a kind of a, 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 an outcome in software, so to speak, because it could be for zero, one, two, three, five. It could be, you know, some number. It's a really perfect example of the 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 top down and the bottom up involved there, right? That you know, if you if you think of if you think of where is the embryo and how many embryos there are as a question that you can answer bottom up, then it's well, you know, these are the parts, so that must make one embryo. But the fact that the whole becomes divided into two parts, that's a macro scale phenomenon. That top down organizes the parts to orchestrate them to make a whole yeah and and then of course we have cases right that are that are um sort of partial right so 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 sometimes they're separate and you can make twins that are completely separate but you can also make ones like this that overlap and there are even human well you can make them in any orientation but there there are human cases of course too right where 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 you've got two bodies and kind of the brain is fused or or vice versa there are all sorts of um there are all sorts of possibilities did I ask you already whether conjoined twins ever join up parts which are not homologous? Yes, you you can. What was the answer? You can. So you can. You... There are that 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 can happen. Yeah, that can happen. But presumably, the conjoining is much more superficial in that case, right? That it just so if I if I make a conjoined twin the joint between the head and the foot, then it, it's only actually integrated at the skin or something. No, it goes pretty deep. So there are, I mean, it can, you know, you can have, you can have this kind of scenario where, where out of the middle of one embryo starts basically sprouting another one. And at the connection, it's nuts. I mean, they're, they're connected all the way, all the way through. Hmm. You know? hmm. Yeah, you hmm. can make, you can make almost, almost anything artificial. And then of course, these things occur naturally too, but, but we can make, especially in something like a chicken, where it's very easy to kind of manipulate all the parts, you can make almost anything. Uh, so I don't know if this is a little bit too nitty gritty, but whilst you were talking about that, I was thinking about Ian's suggestion of opposites and chaos. Mm. Uh, and um, I've still got the logistic map in mind. Do you mind if I share my screen to point out something in the logistic map that I showed? Go for it. 
uh, mic before, but I didn't show Ian. So um, in the logistic map here, you have this first doubling and then another doubling and then another doubling, and then pretty soon it turns mm. into chaos. And it's like, are we up or are we down? And so on this path, we're up. And on this path, we're up, up. And on this path, we're up. And on this path, we're up, down. Right? There's a, whereas this one is down, up, and this one is down, down. So this line going up here, all the way up here is the up, 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 up line. And this one going down here is the down, 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 down line. How come this period doubling ever ends up at this period three, right? Because there is no power of two that ends up in dividing into thirds, right? This resonance, which happens much later on. But as you can see, there's a little sort of trail of dust, a little bit of higher density stuff happening here mm. that corresponds with the, with the point of the third. What's that trail of dust there? Well, that's the... I go down, I go up, 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 down, I go up. So plus a half minus a quarter, plus an eighth minus a sixteenth, plus a thirty second minus a sixty fourth. Look at that. It's a third, right? It gives you the period of the third. Another way of thinking about this, reflecting upon what Ian just said about, well, there's a thing and its opposite, is that in addition to one and minus one, there is also zero. Zero is the unstable thing that you get with a perfect blend of this much minus one and this much one, this much minus a half and this much half, this much minus a quarter and that much eighth. And that comes out at zero, which enables you to have three things instead of two things, instead of the everything up position and the everything down position, there's the exactly canceled out position in the middle. That's the only way to get thirds out of period doubling. And why does the top part of the graph not produce the mirror image thirding that goes on in the bottom half of the graph? Uh, well, it, it, it says, well, that's a good question. So there's a thirding happening here, which lines up with the fifth. Is that one, two, three, four, five? Yeah, oh, sorry, I'm pointing with my finger instead of the mouse pointer. Lines up with there, right? It gives you the other resonant frequency here. And here we have one that this one is canceling out to give you half of a fourth. And this one is canceling out to give you another half of a fourth. And together they give you a period four. So there's the canceling out on the top one, which comes first because it's more squashed. And the canceling out on the bottom one, which comes second because it's less squashed. And when you have one without the other, you have thirds. And you know, if you if you if you take a naive view where you insist on opposites, you say, well, is it A or is it not A? And you say, well, that that's and you get in, you get into this region where you say, it's neither, it's just a mess, it's just chaos. But there's a but there's a a null, which is, you know, first of all, you might identify that as, well, it's neither A or not A, it's it's null, right? But then there's a more precise version of null, which is the perfect, perfect balance of being there and being not there gives you exactly zero, which is, which then takes its place as another genuine state. Now there's one and minus one and zero, three things and not just two. I think it's a I think it's a lovely example of those paradoxes you were talking about at the end of the chapter, Ian, where you're talking about, well, you know, I take this infinite number of steps, but I never see the infinity. I take this infinite number of steps, mm. but I never catch up with the tortoise, right? Mm. So I take this infinite number of steps in the period doubling, uh, but I never really see the third, right? But our eyes mm. see the third for sure, right? Or we don't see that as some overlapping powers of two all smushed together, the, the resonance mm. pops out as, the, oh no, that's a real thing. I wonder if the, I mean, the, the, the question of zero, which of course, as you know, the Greeks didn't have, but was introduced in probably the sixth, seventh century from India. 
um, is is a um, is not such so much a third entity, so to speak, as what happens when you allow opposites to do exactly what I was suggesting we shouldn't do, which is to collapse. I mean, for certain mathematical reasoning, we want them to do that. But what I'm suggesting is that in the in the physical world, um, the the things being asymmetrical um, ultimately can, I mean, they may for certain purposes within very confined systems appear to cancel out, but ultimately they don't. I don't know if that's something you would yeah. agree with, but it, Richard, but or not. But the, but the cancelling out, you say, at the gross scale, it looks like, oh, they disappeared, I've got nothing now. But there's another yes. sense in which, wow, look at all of those, look at all of that spiralling depth that there is in order to create, mm. scale, right? It's like, oh, it's yes. gone this way. Oh, it's gone that way. Oh, it's gone this way. And, you know, that, yes, that right. takes lots and lots of depth uh, to actually to, to cancel them out, to then stay mm. at the top level. Oh, it's almost like it went poof in a puff of smoke and I didn't have anything at all. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Shall we talk about the machine business? Sure. Yeah. Um, do, do do either of you um, know the work of Robert Rosen? Yeah, a little. Who I I think is very interesting, um, and he's probably written about this more clearly than anyone. That uh, that, that a living system has, um, as it were, final causes rather than just efficient causes. In fact, a living system um, is not the result of a, a single efficient cause, whereas a, a closed system that, such as a machine, um, well, it's open in the sense that it's open to an efficient cause, but it all can be accounted for by that efficient cause within that protected space of the machine. Um, whereas in a, in a living being, um, even if you were to be able to start from a, a known standpoint, you'd soon run into problems of complexity where um, re-entrant loops occur, where decisions that cannot be predicted are made in the, within the system and so forth. So this seems to suggest that, I mean, I'm cutting everything very fine here because I talk quite a bit about this, particularly in I suppose chapter 12, um, but my, my view is that there are, so, well, and of course in chapter 27, where I argue that it is almost impossible to talk intelligently about life without talking about the possibility of purpose, teleology, which, you know, Darwin was extremely keen on. Darwin said, thank goodness, and Darwin's bulldog, Huxley also said, the great thing that Darwin has done is restored teleology. <laughs> um, which, as you know, J.B.S. Haldane said was like like the, the scientist's mistress couldn't live without her, but wasn't willing to be seen with her in public. <laughs> and, and I, I think I think this this whole thing of teleology is so important. I mean, whenever you talk to scientists um, one to one and off the record, they say, "Well, of course, there are purposes and purposeful behaviour direct. All of what we watch is directional, um, and yet they're they're forced, as it were, by um, almost like." belonging to the, um, the Soviet um, state and, and there are rules, things you can say and things you can't say just to deny this this existence. So, I mean, that's a good um, a provocative place uh, to begin thinking about the differences between these, these uh, systems. And I outline in chapter 12, uh, which is called The Science of Life, a study in left hemisphere capture, because I believe that while physics um, gave up on this rather simple mechanical model a very long time ago, at least 100 years ago. Um, biology has until very recently clung to this purely mechanical model. And I, yeah. I may be wrong, Michael, but I see you as one of the people who has been able to say, yes, look, there's more to it than this. Yeah. Um... So, so I think so I think we could and and probably should at some point uh, talk about um, uh, the teleology in in machines and cybernetics and all that. But but I I one hundred percent agree. I think I think teleology is is absolutely key to all of this. Uh, the the one thing that the one thing that um, one reason I I 
don't like um, a sharp distinction, and I, I I like Robert's work a lot. Um, I you know, uh, what what I don't like about that sharp distinction between living things and machines is that we know now that as we really didn't in, in when when Robert was was writing this stuff that we can make all the transition forms. So right, and so and so then then we end up in this in this weird place where we have to try to come up with criteria for so so I can you know we can now make something that's basically at every level right so you've got you've got molecular or cellular tissue organ you know, swarm you've got all these levels at every single level we can introduce any percentage you want from zero to fairly high numbers of something that you would call a machine right something that was designed by 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 humans that uh, may be quite complex maybe has unpredictable behavior i mean it's easy to make machines with, with very difficult to predict behaviors but nevertheless they're designed they're completely different from from the natural uh, in in many ways yes yeah and and then and then i don't know what we do after that because because now we have something you know if you have so you, we are already there are humans that are you know, not ninety-five percent human, but there's some there's some electronics there by which they run a wheelchair or some prosthetic limbs or some other stuff, and then we mm. also have these Roomba vacuum cleaners, and pretty soon they'll have some you know some human neural cells living on board to help them do various things, and then yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, sort of sort of every but 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 the and, and those are easy to deal with, right? Because in this case, you say yeah yeah, you're just <laughs> you know you're just a human with some peripherals, and you're just a vacuum cleaner with some 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 human brain cells, fine, but. But we can make right any, and and we're going to be seeing them, cyborgs, hybrids. We're going to be seeing all this stuff, and 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 uh, then then I think we get into a really difficult place where if we try to draw these hard boundaries, and we're interestingly sorry, go on. No, please, no, please finish. finish. Well, well, that that's oh, okay. That, that's just it. You, you no, 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 yeah. I mean. Um... Of course, there's an enormous amount one could say about all of that, but that would be another day, perhaps. But, um, <laughs> but I, 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 I just wanted to make clear that I actually surprisingly don't think there is a hard and fast difference between the living and the non-living. And in fact, um, Robert Rosen said as much. He said that animacy is the norm, and inanimacy is an asymptotic never achieved state in which animacy is reduced to a minimum but the whole cosmos is animate and I, I hold this to be the case so what actually distinguishes them some people would say well clearly um inanimate matter doesn't have consciousness but um we think that living things do have consciousness and now we think that very primitive living things probably have consciousness so it's gone a, a long way down if not to the very bottom of life but in an earlier chapter 25 i think i argue that consciousness is an ontological primitive in the cosmos and that in fact matter is a um a state um a phase of consciousness in which it exhibits greater stickiness permanence resistance than consciousness which has no matter in its form so things persist longer and cause the possibility of resistance. Um, and I believe that, in fact, nothing creative can happen without an element of resistance. So this thing that matter offers is incredibly important. So my view is that um, what we are used to calling inanimate matter does do many of the things very, very, very slowly and very, very, very little that living things do. And what living things bring is not consciousness, because that's already there, but an increase in the capacity to respond and the speed of response. So living things respond to circumstances, to whatever it is that's around them, um, a, you know, perhaps a billion fold faster than an, inan than inanimate matter could possibly do and respond to a vast range of elements that are there in the cosmos. So responding all the time to things much faster and on a much bigger canvas than uh, the inanimate. So I see the difference as a matter of degree, if you like, but not not that this means that there are long phases where you can't tell, but that nonetheless, even though animacy and inanimacy um, do seem very distinct, they do share important qualities, and the difference is more one of degree than of not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would like to 
offer a refinement on that. Um, uh, it's so nice to be able to have a conversation like that and for somebody to be able to say things like that and for us to be nodding along, I think, and it's just like, yep, yeah, I'm on board. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> yes, it is nice and often <laughs> unusual in science. But... <laughs> yeah. uh, so um, we could we could try and pinpoint the um, you know the 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 continuous difference between living and non living in terms of the scale of the physical scale of the capacity to respond, the temporal scale of the capacity to respond, the richness of the capacity to respond, things like that. Um, I think it's, it might, I think there are reasons to suggest that uh, there are some inanimate mechanisms that happen at very large scales and very quickly. Supernova explosion is a very big response and it happens very quickly, but it's still not living. And there are other, there are other things that happen slowly and I'm not sure that the fast or slow and the big or small I don't think you said big or small, actually, I said that. Fast or slow, I'm not sure that that's the right... I'm not sure that going one way makes things more living and going the other thing makes more things more inanimate. I think it's more about the connection between the scales. Is the large scale connected to what's going on at the small scale? Is the fast scale connected to what's going on at the slow scale? When those things are collected, connected, they behave organically, they behave... Uh, animately and when those things are not connected then they behave like hard balls in space whether they're big or small or fast or slow they just behave like hard balls in space may i respond to that uh, mike mm. I, I i i like that very much um and perhaps i could clarify that what i meant was not that um inanimate things can never do something fast, like a volcano exploding. Um, but that generally speaking, um, without a cataclysmic force, mm. um, th there is no, mm. there is this fast, this, the fastness of response. I'm, to, I'm talking about a, a response to the whole set of circumstances. So for example, um, there's a lump of rock in my garden and I don't know what it is responding to, but it, whatever it's responding to, perhaps wind, water and so on, it's responding to extremely slowly. But there is also a vole in the flower bed that is responding to everything a billion times faster at least in a way that uh, inanimate stuff just doesn't seem to do this. It, complex reactions to many facets, many different kinds of values if you like of affordances to use the that mm -hmm. um kind of language it, it there are many 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 affordances for living creatures um and, and they they use them very rapidly whereas lumps of matter tend not to that's that's one thing yeah. i just wanted to say so the other is i don't know yeah. whether i think it's true this thing about the bridging of the scales but i was very interested in um a, a, a an observation be, made by Mike Abramovitz that that there are different what he calls structures he calls the distinction he's making between architective structures and um connective structures and what he means by architective structures are um things that are relatively rigid and and um and static, and when they change, um, when they make a change, they make a complete change, and it's it's as where it is a cataclysm. Um, and there are things that are connected that change by means of flowing change, and that they are more. I mean, I don't know which bits of my book you've had a chance to catch up with, and I'm I'm extremely grateful. Said, yeah. Being able to, I can't remember what I sent, but uh, chapters fourteen and fifteen, and another section on induction and deduction. Oh, okay, yes, yes, that was because of what you said about that. But yes, but anyway, I, I, I think this is an issue of the difference between concatenation and flow is absolutely essential, mm -hmm. and these types of motion where things flow from one state into another, um, 
and these architective states which hold themselves until there's a, a break and that they're rather like what Taleb calls um, fragile states. Um, and the, the connected ones are anti-fragile. They, they make adaptations all the time so that they don't have that cataclysmic need to change. And he, he, the reason I'm mentioning all this is that he suggests that at the, at the very lowest level and particularly at the very highest level of magnitude, you only find connected, connective states. And that the architective states are found more at the intermediate phase um, where where we happen to be leading our lives and have our experience. I've, I've probably given a very bad account of that, but it's um, I, I do a better job in the book. <laughs> Thank you. Who, who was, who was the, whose terms were those, architective and connective? There are um, a, 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 a now retired physicist called Mike Abramovitz, but he has um, a very interesting uh, web and we've corresponded and... Uh, so there we are. That makes a lot of sense to me. So there's a sense mm. in which the rock in your garden can respond to things quickly. Like if you kick it, it moves in, you know, from one part of, you know, moves a little bit, you hit it with a hammer and it moves a little bit, it moves a little bit across the garden. And in a sense, that's a response to the force that's acted on it. But uh, there's, you know, but but then the uh, the architective structure, if I can use that term already, isn't changed, right? It's it's still the same rock. It's just over mm. here instead of over mm. there. It didn't really it didn't change its relationship to anything, and so doing it, and it didn't change its internal organizational connective structure in response to that being hit with a hammer, right? But there's there are um, like the minimal example of a physical system that I've been thinking about recently that has some connection between the between scales is resonance in, uh, in in systems that resonate. So like in a tuning fork or a piece of steel, when you hit that, it doesn't just move. It doesn't just transfer the impulse and say, well, okay, I'll be over here. But when you hit it and it rings, there is a really intimate connection between the macro scale geometry of the fork as a whole mm -hmm and the micro scale elasticity of the molecules of steel holding it together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one needs yes. to be, uh, um, you know, a, an integer product, an integer um, multiple of the other in order for mm -hmm. you to get a resonant standing wave in that geometry. And there's an intimate connection between the whole organizing the parts and the parts organizing the whole. And yes. I don't think it's any coincidence I that we say that, a, that a, the ringing of a bell feels organic or has lifelike structure to it when you know when we I think I think that's because of its resonance and I think this idea of resonance reverberative connectivity is essential to the understanding of, of um, well just just about everything but certainly living things w w what I think I may have misled you by saying is I, 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 I what, what he's referring to is that there are certain kinds of things which are like um, chemical interotrophic for the constituents they they lose their qualities completely and become something else so an evil smelling greenish yellow gas mixes with some dull metal and it becomes table salt and as it were they've lost what they had before this is architective change he says but there are other things that um mix with one another, add themselves to things, and work by accretive processes, where their um, existence is not a zero something, they, they have to go and something else comes. They are able to cause something to create a bigger, um, a, a bigger uh, entity out of the smaller elements that have come together. And, and I think that's all really that one needs to to take on board for, for that point. I don't want to labor it, but it just seems to me quite interesting that he spots that that um, catastrophic uh, scale is uh, is above the, 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 the scale of particles in physics, but is below the scale of um, the cosmos. And in the cosmos and in the, the very um, subatomic regions, what you see is not um, cataclysms in which one thing is wiped out and changes its nature completely, but that things come together and 
and create, as they do in, in, in the wider cosmos, to create something new, but not, it's not catastrophic for the constituent parts. Mm, yeah, I get it. I get it. Mm. It's, it's, and so the, the music metaphor for me is like when you, when you put two notes together and they're concordant, mm. uh, you know, both the notes are still there and they created something new. They created the interval. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but when you put two notes together which are discordant, then they just crash, and it yes. seems to tear apart the the two notes that you had. Yes, that's a good good metaphor. But what an extraordinary thing it is that by putting two completely meaningless, bland things together, a note and another note, you suddenly create an event <laughs> and an experience. And that the more you add, you can do things that are completely unpredictable from the outside yet you can only know them when you hear them yes you can't tell so when if i give you uh 469 hertz and 468.9 hertz you cannot tell the difference between those separately, played separately, right? But when I play them together, you can hear the beat. You can hear the beating as they go in and out of phase. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was something um, I, I could, I'd like to return to the possibility of the hybrids and cyborgs that Mike was talking about. And what we were just talking about, about whether, whether there's multiple scales involved in the, in the dynamics or the system or the algorithm that's running. So um, in computer science, we have this notion of an algorithm being substrate independent, that you can implement a, the same algorithm in multiple different substrates, and it just doesn't matter because the the details of the substrate that you implemented it on just don't matter to the essentially symbolic and discrete computation that you're doing at the higher level, right? In I other words, think, it's all syntax and no semantics. Right. So yeah. by divorcing it of all of the concrete details of the instances, you get yeah. something that you can apply to other instances. You get the generalization, right? You get, the, oh, it's the same sure. algorithm, not yet. Uh, sure. But you you lose that connection to the concrete instances uh, in a way that the symbols that you're manipulating don't have any meaning, right? That you know, I just mm -hmm. if you if you treat them abstractly, then they are, mm -hmm. as you said, you know, pulled out of uh, their context in which they had some meaning. Mm -hmm. Now, so that that notion of the substrate independence of algorithms suggests that you know you could replace part of an organism with a machine or part of a machine with an organism and it wouldn't really matter or you would create something that was in between but i'm not so sure about that uh i think that when we implement an algorithm on a machine in a conventional sense um we are doing so in a way which is as divorced as possible from the physical implementation of it so that it doesn't matter what numbers I put into my sorting algorithm, it never makes my logic gates overheat, right? That, you know, that getting to the physics of what I implemented it on just doesn't matter. Like whatever computation I do on it just doesn't, doesn't interact with the physical implementation. But in organisms, it's not just that it does interact with the physical implementation, but that they are organisms because it interacts with the implementation. So when you, you know, you can get an organism to behave like an AND gate if you put it in the right circumstances. But when you make it do it over and over again, it says, fuck this. And it crawls out of the dish and does something else, right? That, you know, that, that it, the interaction with the substrate of which it is made matters. And it, it matters not just because it, oh, it's an unreliable algorithm then. It wasn't perfectly abstracted. It wasn't that wasn't really a good way of implementing an AND gate then. It was, that was the thing that made it organic was that when you, when you stress your, you stress one level of function, the, 
the implementational level of function below it begins to show. It begins to show through. Mm. And that's really important for me for being able to get those responses that you were talking about, a quick response. Uh, mm. It's by reorganizing the function. It's like, okay, well, I won't do that function. Then I'll do this function, right? And, and a lot of the... A lot of the higher level and lower level integrity, the higher level and lower level structure is still there, but it's been reorganized. Whereas when you do that with a mechanical device it, and you push it beyond its limits, well, first of all, when you push it beyond its limits, it doesn't it doesn't show you the in-between states and you need the in-between states because it can't really be adaptive. It can't really learn unless it's inside show. And when it's insides do show, you just say, ah, oh, shit, I broke it. Right? because it doesn't it doesn't degrade gracefully because you went straight from this really really high level symbolic stuff to the physics it was made out of you know multiple levels below mm. and that uh that means that when you when the insides do show it just it just breaks it doesn't it doesn't degrade gracefully mm. Mm. I think yes, I don't know enough about the systems that you're working with, really, but how they would how they would could be adapted to the way a plant takes in fifteen kinds of measures and synthesizes them, and as it were, makes a decision about whether or not it's time to bud or flower or whatever it may be. I'm, I'm sure you could find algorithms that could make an artificial flower do something like this but i don't know that it would be anything at all like the flower i i i don't know yeah it's uh, like unfortunately how, I, I, i'm not a cyberneticist so yeah how the flower behaves under normal circumstances could probably mm. be extracted into such an algorithm involving 15 variables and a bit of logic but what's mm. really interesting about the flower is what it does when you put it under circumstances that are not quite like that right when you know when mike does an experiment mm. and says you know cuts it in half when it was half only half when it was just a, a seedling how many plants do you yes. get right and that's mm. you know now it's making two decisions this one is deciding differently from that one how did it make two how can how can one thing make two decisions right it's like because uh that's right and also I, I, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this situation sounds different from the execution of an algorithm where, um, and, and I described this in, in one of the chapters, but uh, effectively, um, Monica Galliano has done experiments with uh, pea shoots where they're deprived of light and the light comes on in a Y-shaped structure that is over the bed in which they are, and it comes on in one or other arm of the Y, entirely at random. Um, it, uh, uh, so uh, you can't predict each time which it will be. But um, sometime before uh, the light comes on, the, a puff of air is sent down the arm of the, the tube out of which the light is going to come. And these pea shoots that are starved of light benefit from orientating themselves towards where the light is coming from. And I believe that in only three days, they learn to orientate towards where the puffs of light are coming from, puffs of air are coming from, because yeah. that's where the light will come from. And intriguingly, the uh, reverse case has also been done as a control in which the puff of air comes down the arm from which the light will not come. And the pea plants, appropriately, in the other, again, within a few days, learn. Now, that's not something they could conceivably have been, as it were, programmed by, either from the, their own experience or from any uh, past um, historical experience. This seems like intelligent behavior. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't have any problem with that. Mike's not surprised, mm. right? <laughs> no, 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 I'm not surprised. Uh, yeah, and, and I think, uh, you know, I think, I think what we were just saying about... Uh, you don't see what it can do until you stress it is is 100 percent i mean this is why yeah this is one reason why why uh teleology well, it's not the it's not the biggest reason but one reason why people aren't into it is because what they observe most of the time is 
the default behavior, let's say, of embryos, and they think it's a purely feed-forward emergent system. They say, oh, complexity and emergence, right? So local rules, we know local rules can give rise to complexity, and look, it does this thing. Well, there you go. So, and, and they say, well, you can't just label that as, as intelligence, you know, it's like, a, it's, it's, it's just, it's just, that's what it has to do. And, and that's true. If all you do is observe the, the standard default behavior, but once you start putting barriers in its way and you start uh, stressing it in various ways, then, then you, you pu get pulled out of this false sense of uh, 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 inevitability. And you see that, oh, it actually, it actually has what, uh, some degree, depending on what you're looking at, of what James called intelligence, which is the ability to reach the same goal by different means. And you start to see the, yes. the incredible ingenuity uh, that, that these things can muster in different problem spaces. Um, to, uh, okay, I'll, uh, I, I apologize. I have to, uh, I have to run. Um, can we, uh, yeah.